Tilo, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, even though, you know, I moved to Miami recently, you know. It's finally a nice day out here. Um, don't forget, I do have merch. The link is down in the description. I got a couple orders, finally. Got a couple orders. Um, I didn't know it was this much of a process to be sending them out, but they coming to you. Don't worry. Whoever's ordered, they coming. Uh, let's get into this. Deadly da Danny Dyer's Deadliest Men, Season 1, Episode 3, Vic Dark. We're gonna get it done. They're gonna keep high. On both sides of the law, I'm gonna find out what makes them tick. How they got their fearsome reputations. We know the script already. Let me see. Best editor on YouTube. It's not enough light in this room. That's the problem. That's why it keeps doing this little thing right here. I mean, next to me, you see how the color is different. I can only try my best to get it as good as I can, you know. There we go. This is my man. I've heard a lot of stories I'm about Eastern to, villains. I'm going to try to go without headphones. Um, maybe this is not the best time to try it on a long video like this, but, you know, let's try it. Just big crowds would use a double barrel shotgun. This guy, Vic Dark, is as hard as they come. We didn't really give a shit about anyone. You just mentioned his name, people quiver. Don't upset him because he, he you know, he just, he just take your head off. I've already bench pressed oh, 160, right. that's two of me. And he loves guns. The cop is sitting next to me, I've got the gun in his neck like that. He's a man of honor. But if you cross him, you can't. I'm back in my own manor, London's East End. For much of its history, it was the center of the capital's criminal underworld. It's my home turf, but will it be my toughest job yet? This is not just a birthplace of the chirpy Cockney and Jelly Dills. As well as being my manor, it was the home to a certain Victor Dark, one of the East End's most feared armed robbers. Had it been a life of glamour, or would I find that his crimes have haunted his entire life? The East End's a dark place. And there's a lot of tough neighborhoods. Me and Vic. Not gonna lie. That decline bench press that he was doing, that's one of my favorite workouts. I don't even know why. It just is. It could 30 years apart. But both being hammers, I'm hoping we're gonna. We're gonna have something in common. I'm gonna try and get inside his head. But I'm not sure I'm gonna like what I see. He's the kind of character I get asked to play in films. But this is my chance to meet the real McCoy. Vic Dark. I've been trying to do this reaction to, to, to Vic Dark for like months. Y'all don't even know. He believed in hitting them hard and hitting them fast. And he's got a rap sheet as long as my arm to prove it. From 1974 to 1988, uh -huh. he carried out hundreds of raids on security vans, banks, post offices and even a packed nightclub he wasn't the kind so he was certified at robin stuff salute youtube i do not condone that type of behavior i'm just saying salute to plan big jobs like the great train robbery and he never scooped as much as the legendary brinks mat job he was all about the smash and grab organized chaos more than organized crime but it led him to spend 21 years in the slammer 21 of them things I don't want to cross him, so I'm going to play it easy. All right, Vic. All right, Dan, mate. How are you, mate? All right. Brings back a few memories, can in town, doesn't it? And you don't live around here no more, do you? No, I wouldn't live around here. Pay me, Dan. No? No, I've never been in <laughs> fucking years. No? No, you're joking. Nowadays, he doesn't make his money out of crime. Using his name and reputation, he's a legalised debt collector. And that reputation Vic is pretty the nasty. Vic debt collector. We used to have a little bottle of ammonia. Which is like if I squirted you, you know, it sort of blind you sort of for a few days or a couple of hours. This would be at innocent bank tellers. Even his closest friends know they shouldn't mess with him. There is people out there that he hasn't got respect for. And then people just stay away. 
just to totally stay away. I'm, I don't get frightened too much, but if I was one of them, I'd be frightened. Very frightened. <coughs> and I said to him, what happened if you get these heroes to come up to try and stop you? He said, in his own words, I'll blow their fucking head off. I always remember watching that. You feel me? I mean, listen, don't be a hero. The, the number one way to stay alive is to mind your business. I summed him up, was Charles Bonson, you know, not the actor Charles, but, uh, you know, Charles Bonson and Nick, and he, he said, Rick, Rick Dark is the real McCoy. He is. <laughs> In 1974, at the age of 17, Vic earned his notoriety as the leader of the Sledgehammer Gang. So called because of the way they smashed down the cashier's screens of banks and post offices. We just pull up here with a car safe. Four of us will get out. No, three of us will get out. It'll be a geezer drive. My bad if there's a clicking, man. Y'all, y'all, I'm trying to get some new headphones, but I need them to be at least this quality. I have had these headphones since I was like 19. So, they're pretty old, so I get why they're gone out. But the Sledgehammer gang, that's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> then all of a sudden, it would just walk straight across there, Sledgehammer, the guns, walk straight into there when it's the most busiest time. Take, up, take down the screens, get behind the screens. We used to have big bags at the time, Dan. Like we used to come across, they show big, like, they're like post office bags, yeah. great big bags. And when we got behind the, behind the tills, my mate would be in the littlest one. He'd open the, either get the door open and get in and just get in, or just chuck all the money in the bags. Straight in, yeah. Yeah, that's how we used to do it. So we didn't really give a shit about anyone. Yeah. He was in there for five minutes, just clearing out all the money. Then we'd just come straight out of here, get back in the cars and drive off. In and out, five minutes. Yeah, that's it, that was it. Every till would have 10 grand behind it, and they'd pick the busiest times to crash in. Nobody move! So, this is at a post office? Post offices, I, I'm not sure if post offices here have money at them. 10,000 behind each thing? That sounds crazy to me. I don't even think they have money at the post office here. It surprises me that you obviously look, going in there when, it, when it's... Uh, in the States. When it's, you know, when, it, when it's the most busy, you know? I would have thought you'd wait for it to calm down, but obviously it makes sense because that's money, when the yeah. most bows there, obviously. Yeah, yeah. There will be guns firing everywhere, warning shots over people's heads, panic all over the place. What they didn't like, the robbery squad, because we were so young, we was only like 20 years old, obviously we're coming into the banks and sorting office, like big post offices, steaming straight in, nicking all the wedge out of it and coming straight out. We didn't, they were saying we didn't give a fuck for no one. Literally we had confrontations with people, obviously a few times. I mean, how many would you keep it to a minimum? I mean, how many would you do a month, a week? I mean, you, would, you would never do two in a day, would you? Would that be taking a piss? Three. Three in a day? <laughs> I was, was just beginning to see why it got his reputation. Three lots of innocent people a day, terrorised with ammonia, sledgehammers and guns. Not nice. <laughs> These raids went on for four years, until the law Ooh. finally caught up with him in 1978. The thing I be liking about Danny is, don't forget he is an actor, man. He be acting like, like he coming up to these and meeting these people with no cameras around. Like, you're fully camera around you. You're good. He said I had to play it cool. No, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, you Coming did, up, didn't. I'm gonna find out about the night when it all went wrong. Blood spurting everywhere. It's like, it's like an art piece. Like, if they want to kill you, they want to kill you. I'll turn around and went, got that. I went bang, bang over the top of their heads. No, no cap though, I don't care what nobody say. Danny Dyer is one of my favorite narrators of these documentaries. Him, Rose Kemp, this doesn't get any better. To me, y'all keep Lewis Thorax, that y'all keep telling me about him, I might gotta check him out. Vic Dart was one of the most prolific armed robbers this country has ever seen. Hundreds of banks, security vans, and post offices raided and thieved from. He's exactly the sort of person you don't want to piss off. If you do meet him, you better not cross him. He's a lovely fella, but you don't want to see him flip. Because if he flipped, he might let off one of these. The tool? Like every workman, <laughs> Vic had his tools. People didn't just hand over the cash to him. He held them up. He intimidated them. He pointed loaded guns at them and threatened to take their lives. He went the extra mile, so... Hey, it's funny because, I don't know, this probably was across the hoods like in the world, but uh, before we called them um, Blicks, we used to call them Tools. 
if it was big crowds, we'd use a double barrel shotgun, Tooling. which is like sort of snoring off, which is like looks the part. Or if it was like quick robberies, like security vans, would be handguns. With shotguns, there was more frightening, really. So the bigger the crowds, like a big sorting office, it would be like a sawn off shotgun. To get through the screens, we'd use hammers, big sledgehammers. Obviously, the guns I fired off was over people's heads, you know, so it wasn't at the people. I'd done martial arts for a long time. It's like when they kick, you go, Aah! you go, Aah! it's just like bang, you go, Aah! So it's just a bank and jump, really. Not like that. <laughs> Obviously, once you fire a, a gun into someone, once again, you're going to kill them, aren't you? Vic Dark probably played great charades. <laughs> I've not got any intention to shoot anyone, you know, so I might that, that's quite clear in the robber's code. You don't go and shoot people. Robber's code or not, I can't help thinking that the people at the other end of the gun probably thought their life was over. I could see he knew what he was talking about. Now, I've played my fair share of villains in films, but didn't really know how it was done. He joined me opposite this bank to give me the inside track. Do you plot up in a little cafe opposite, or, I mean, what did you do a couple of days before, or...? No, what it is, a lot of people do fall over, because what happens, they, have, they, they go and plot something up a couple of days before, all they do is run back to CVTV and they say, who's in the area? Who was here at this time? So you're best off, what, a couple of months before, or...? Yeah, about a month before. About a month, but yeah, yeah, six weeks. And then come back, just do a little fly one, just one person, make sure everything's still the same. Yeah. And then come back, that's how you do it, really. Would he now be doing anything else differently from the 70s? Given a blueprint. Hey, listen, I wonder if Danny Dyer, after he did these Deadliest Men, he became a better actor because, honestly, he did have the inside, like, school. He had a better knowledge of it, and it just helped his acting career. I'm pretty sure it did. Well, basically, well, it's the sort of same methods, balaclava helmets or any, you know, anything with identity, gloves, you know, sort of like thin leather gloves or anything what you wouldn't leave fingerprints about. you just got to be a little bit more aware of the cameras, a little bit aware of, like, leaving DNA. And, and obviously, you know, if you discharge a firearm or anything like that, it would go up your nose, like residue. What's the different approaches to... Obviously a bank and, uh, you know, a van. There's different approaches to every kind of robbery. A bank's a sort of solid, so you know you're going to go in there, might be six or seven tills, mm. if, if, if the safe's open. But the actual security vans works on speed, you know, like the guard gets out, bang you out the oh, back of the vehicle, yeah. bang, you've got them straight away. Or if you're going to take on the big heavy duty one, you're going to stop the van, get in the back of the van, or do you know what I mean? So it depends. It's every, every robbery's so different from each one. How many people would you got to work with? I mean... It's crazy, because back then, all the criminals are now debt collectors. <laughs> it's wild. Obviously, you got paid by the kind Like, it's still the same thing. You're still almost a criminal, but then it's for the better good. Like, it, it, almost a criminal. You go on basically getting people's money back, but it feels like you're robbing They're different jobs. I mean, you got the brains, you've got <laughs> uh, the brawn. Or, I mean, how would, it, how would it work? If you're in, in with the traps and, and the, like, the arm... I'm Robert Well type of thing, you would know who's good at who. Obviously a very short list of people. Yeah. But if someone's going to have a van and you want a professional person who's good at the van, you, you pick him out going on a bit of work with him. Or if you want to do a big sorting office, a big post office, you, you'll be going to work on sort of, um, you know, that type of people who are good at what they do. I knew that Vic had been good at what he'd done, but I hey, knew that the hey, law would hey, eventually hey, caught hey. up with him. In total, Vic spent 21 years of his life behind bars. That's more than half his adult life. In 1978, he went down for the armed robberies. It wasn't his first time inside, but it was his first long sentence. I've done four months for an ABH. I've done three years for a stabbing, GBH. I've done 12 years for a bank, three sorting offices and a security van. I've been in most prisons around the country, mostly up north. Even Pentonville I was in when I was a kid. Albany, Parkhurst, Lincoln, Durham, Full Sutton, Franklin, Long Larton, Strangeways, Walton, Strangeways. Belmarsh, Scrubs, Wandsworth, Brixton. Just keeps going on, nearly every, every, nearly every prison in the system. 
but his longest sentence was still to come. He gets out in 1986, but it's not long before his addiction to crime gets him into trouble again, and this time... I'm glad you used that word addiction, Danny, because you're right, this is an addiction. It will be the stuff of legend. Sometimes it only takes one night, one misjudgment, and you're facing a 15-year sentence. No cap. The news from ITM. In the early hours of this morning, he and his accomplice, both armed with handguns, raided a nightclub in Ilford and shot the owner who's now in hospital after having surgery. I got shot in the hand, I got shot in the groin, uh, and I got shot through the arm. Now, when you say groin, do you mean the... The, the bar- penthouse the, nightclub. The, the bollock? Or do you mean the groin like the layered groin? Ilford. September 1988. It's 3am. Vic's brought an accomplice with him to help on the job. I was bored. That's how, that's how it all starts, I'm bored. You know what I mean? I'm tr- a bit trigger happy, a bit bored, taking on. It didn't really matter what I'd done. I could do security vans, banks, sorting offices. It didn't really matter to me. Up and down, it could be anything. Anything where there was money. Come on, yeah, he's bored. Do it. That, that's what it was about. He's bored, and there's 30 grand in this club. Vic and his accomplice get let in the back door by someone on the inside. They hide in a back room, waiting for a signal to move. You sort of stand there, all getting ready, got the stuff on. So they put the mask on, put the, you're just waiting. All of a sudden, Is this the same? then it happens, <laughs> and it? You go, that means give him 10 minutes to get off the, out of the gaff, then I'm coming out. He gives his accomplice what he thinks is a simple job. All he's got to do is get the money and rip the phones out. That's all he's got to do. Yeah. Anyway, it goes bang. What I've got to do now, the first thing I'll do, I've got to get everyone under control. Meaning I've got to wrap them all, or get them all together, get them all together, wrap them up, have the money, slip off. That's, that's what was supposed to happen. Nice and easy. Well, you know, what goes on next is unbelievable. But his accomplice doesn't get the phones off and the old bill are called. They surround the place. There's over a hundred punters still in the club. Vic's got them lying on the floor, but the place is panicked. Everyone's running everywhere. Down. Can you imagine now, you've got 120 people running fucking everywhere, right? So I've got them all down in here. It's at this point in the story where we see Vic turn. He takes the owner of the club and makes him kneel in the centre of the dance floor holding a gun to his head. The uh, paramount thought that I had is just how helpless I was. If they want to kill you, they want to kill you. For I sure. grabbed what might or might not have been the gun, and of course it was a gun, and it went off actually in my hand. I was holding the barrel, and when it came down, I got shot in the stomach as well. You don't feel anything when you get shot. No, you don't. You just feel the burn. The bullet passes through. That's what my homie told me. He said, you don't feel it initially, because you got adrenaline pumping through you, but you feel it, it just starts burning. You just start feeling heat. (laughs) With the club owner. And then the after effects. To the shoulder of Vic's accomplice. My mate gets shot, the bullet goes through his arm, through here, out of his back, right? He's like that, blood spurting everywhere. It's like, it's like an art, but he's going... Sh- sh- sh. There were two injured men, but Vic was only concerned about his accomplice, not the club manager. I lost a lot of blood uh, and uh, apparently caused a blood shortage in Essex uh, and very nearly died. Oh, wow. David's there condition was, a... was critical Wait, what? Essex. I lost a lot of blood. Uh, and uh, apparently caused a blood shortage in Essex oh. uh, and very nearly died. David's condition was critical. I can't imagine what it must be like to be shot three times. Vic wasn't interested though. He still had a long night ahead. I've got two options. Take me close. I'm not gonna lie, man. I don't care if it hurt or not. I'm glad I ain't never been shot. I've been shot at, but I'm glad I never got hit. Mm. It was seven bullet holes in the car. Missed every, every one of them. Missed. <laughs> clothes off. Put, put me natural clothes back on. Walk out. No, I'll get away. Or do I have to carry this, my mate, and get him away? So Vic takes his accomplice and carries him out, leaving behind 100 stunned clubbers, the wounded owner, and all the cash. It's been a total disaster, but it's not over yet. As I'm getting here, then right. I'm carrying him, mate, now. I've got him like this. Yeah. Like that. So I've got this thing like yeah. As I'm carrying like that, as I go like that, a police car goes bang. Yeah. Just pulls in front of me. I haven't got to the car. I can't get to the car. Police Obviously. car there. Police car there. I, t- I told the copper, I said, get out. Get out of the car. I didn't want the copper. I wanted the car. To put me, mate, in the car. <laughs> I didn't put me injured, like, you know. 
So I just got my mate in the car. Then I looked, so I thought, oh, fuck it. I took, I got the copper, he got back, we got to put the copper back in the car. Then we're off. This is the moment that catapulted Vic from up. Wait, what? My man just said he told the cop to get out the car. The cop got out the, this gotta be unarmed police. They got out the car, put his friend in the car, and then was like, you know what, no, man, just get in the car to the cop, and he get drove with the cop. What? Armed robber to police hostage taker, making him in the eyes of the law, one of the most dangerous men in the country. For sure. The old genius racing. So what you imagine, I'm sitting there like that, I'm in the car, the cop is sitting next to me, I've got the gun in his neck like that. So as, as I've said to the geese, I've said to him, you fucking drive, right? And he went, all right. As I've gone like that to take the gun off his neck to see if my mate was all right, there's a loud explosion. As the, ex as the explosion went, the glass fell out, obviously the gun had gone off. The police are in pursuit. So Vic points his gun at his cop hostage and gets him to call off the chase. He realises he's going to have to change cars and they pull into a random side street, knock at a door and an Irishman answers. Uh oh, Irishman. He goes in, gets the keys, comes out. Instead of taking the keys and walking away, he tries to give me the keys. But as he tries to give me the keys, I can't take the keys. I've got two handguns. Mm. I've got a handgun in each hand. Mm. So the, sort of the Irishman looked at me, I looked at him, and now he's looked at me, and he knows he's seen the guns. I thought, so I said to him, right, you're coming with me, mate. Dang. Hostage number two. And unfortunately for Vic, the Irishman's wife calls the police and tells them what's happened. Soon. He's got the armed response team on his towel. Why is there so much action early in this? I'm battle? every out numbers, every out guns. I've got a wounded man. He's proper, proper on me now, right? I still will not give up on my mate. I mean, no one in England has ever. That's a true friend through and through. Let that have been a Chicago dude. Hey, buddy would have been gone bleeding. <laughs> he would have met. The heavenly gates are... I took out a geezer at a surrounded building you see surrounded by police. Vic drops his accomplice at a safe house where he stays hidden. He's never caught by the police, but for Vic, it's a different ah. story. The chase... Loyal to a T. Loyalty got you jammed. But I ain't nothing wrong He's taken out loyalty. to a rural Essex. The car crashes. Vic runs out and hijacks another car. They forced a Vietnamese restaurant worker to drive them further. Did you believe he would kill you? Yes. I think that sometime he might suit me. The reenactments. The reenactments in this. This is the best deadly, deadly, deadliest man episode I've ever seen. This is good. <laughs> Look at the music. So what I did, I turned around and went, not at them. I went bang, bang over the top of their heads. So like, so, but I don't know what's happening. Then all of a sudden I see, back like yellow flashes you know what i mean obviously they're firing back at me but i wasn't fine i weren't trying to hurt them anyway they was over there so i just dug a big hole got a few plants put them on the head and all that laid there right now they know i'm in the fields they know i'm here somewhere. The i don't know where so i just laid down then they come back through again back through again now this is for nearly six hours then all of a sudden I get, I get a bit pat, I thought myself, I get a thing called hypothermia, where I'm in the earth, it's yeah, soaking, yeah, I start really yeah, shaking, yeah. do you know what I mean? And with that, Vic had had enough. He crawled out of the muddy hole to face the music. Just over there, I stood up, and then that, that was it, Dan. I walked out, there was about fucking 150 coppers that day. I come out with my hands up. Wow. And then, um, There's just nowhere to go, was there, really? Nah, I was fucked, so I was bottled in. But they said to me, when I got back to the police station, they were about to give up. Another hour, they were gone. I really? thought I lost me. Yeah. So if I just stayed for another hour, I would never got nicked. That night. But you know that hour was life or death. You had hypothermia was sitting there. If you would have dressed more, you know, if you had a jacket on and some thermal pants, you would have been good. Crime cost Vic a 15-year sentence, and for his victim, it changed his life forever. It's a cowardly way, and it's a lazy way to just try and pinch what somebody else has got. Especially, I'm running a one-man operation. I mean, it virtually put me out of business. David spent five agonizing weeks in hospital trying to recover from his gunshot wound. And I remember when I got home, eventually, and I couldn't get out of the car. I couldn't, I couldn't lift my leg up. And people don't realize these sort of things. You know what's crazy? My boy, he got shot at the club, outside the club. 
at my homegirl, you know, I ain't really talking to her right now. She get on my nerves. She got shot too at her knee outside of a club. Be careful. Vic had shot and injured an innocent person and taken a copper hostage. I wasn't surprised he was to have a difficult ride in jail. At the age of 31, Vic started his sentence as a top security category AA prisoner with terrorists and murderers as companions. For much of that time, Vic was thrown into what they call the blocks in the segregation unit. He was on his own for months at a time. I've been in segregation units for many years and I've been down there for months and I've been pushed to the limits where they play about with your food, they games, don't let you out on it. Exercise, they just like absolutely push you to the limits, turn the eating off, you've got, you have to you're sleeping in your clothes, putting things in your food so you can't eat it, cockroaches or things or anything they can find, you know, and it, it's a proper head game in the prison system. And if they don't like you, you go into the blocks, and that's, that's nice. where most of the beatings take place. People will be beaten up really bad in the units, which I've been beaten up quite a few times. Had my leg, I had to walk on crutches for nearly, I, I think, a month and then I could, could walk properly for about a year where it hit my, leg, my ankle with a truncheon. So basically I've seen brutality done to myself and many other prisoners. I couldn't help thinking that prison isn't meant to be nice for criminals who hold guns to people's heads. But it had really affected Vic. He told me a story of his friend coming off hunger strike. Something what really shook me and brought tears to my eyes I was in a place called Full Sun. I was doing a 15 then, and there was an old boy. His name, I want to say his name was Ronnie, an old boy. He was on hunger, tri hunger strike. He'd been on hunger strike for about nearly three months. So you imagine. I've heard of people going on hunger strike in prison. I mean, I'm not saying uh, starving yourself is not an easy thing to do. You know, as long as you got water, you can survive for some weeks. But I probably wouldn't that hard because prison food is nasty. I'm just saying. Hey, stop. His bag of bones. Yeah. Oh, man, this great big screw walking up, undoing his door with his dinner, and I see him standing out and go, in his food. And then I see that Ronnie, a 63 year old man weighing about seven stones, stand there and eat his food in front of the screw. I mean, how brave is that? I mean, it made me have tears in my eyes, yeah. mate. Yeah. I mean, when you see things like that. We're spitting it? I guess if you're coming off a hunger strike, hey, it is what it is. You ain't eating X amount of days. But... And then you've got the prison system, humanity. Yeah. They don't know the fucking word nah. then. Don't nah. fucking know the word, mate. Nah. What would you say how it is now, That's the prison system up. now? I mean, obviously you haven't been there in a while, but um, I mean, from what you had to deal with and from what it is now, I mean, what would you say it's worse or...? No, I just think these silly who <laughs> turn around and say, um, it's easy, it's like an holiday camp in prison. Yeah, for the cat sees. I mean, I talk about the cat A's who bang up 23 hours a day. Well, they might have their telly now, but it don't matter. They don't get out of their cells. No. I mean, I talk about cat I was a cat A for nearly 10 years. So what I'm saying, it's close to my heart. Mm. It's OK for these knobs to get on telly and say, oh, uh, on, and say, it's an holiday camp, it's this and that. But not, not for cat A. Ah, OK. So most of these that I be watching, they don't be category A. They be cat C. They be in there with Nintendo Wii's. They be in there with ATM machines, Bitcoin machines. <laughs> they be in there with better. They be in there with Serta Tempur-Pedic color purple beds. Okay. <coughs> it's Cat C, not Cat A. Coming up, I'll find out about Vic's influence today. Since I've been seen out with him, everyone pays me on time. Well, it's quite really, yeah. <laughs> I'll meet his new girlfriend. I don't know everything. I don't really want to know <laughs> everything. And discover what Vic thinks of the Rosers. What you're up against no. one of the biggest firms, tastiest firms, oh, no. well, funded firms probably in the world. Firms? What y'all talking about, man? Vic Dark, a bank robber, armed to the hilt with son of shotguns, a hostage taker, and a man who's done 21 years porridge. During that time, he'd met some men that are still his mates today. Vic's invited me to a barbecue. Now he's told me these are the real Essex boys, yeah? So, 
Hanging out with hooligans is one thing, but these guys are serious. I don't want to end up in a country lane, you know what I mean? So this was, uh, Deadliest Man was obviously shot after um, the foot, real football factories. See what these boys have got to say. Unlike Vic, <coughs> most of this lot haven't been inside. It's like a real Fast and Furious scene, man. You know, at the end, how Dom and them be having a barbecue. Mate, yeah. Yeah. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. Oh, I'm a friend of Vic's, mate. How you doing? How, how you doing, son? Yeah. Pleasure, mate. You're good as gold. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you. I'm as well, Thank mate. <laughs> good man. Good to meet you, mate. Pleasure. All right, mate. <coughs> oh, yeah, you all right? This is Gavin. He was inside for manslaughter at Maidstone Prison. Yeah, no, good as gold, man. Did you want a beer? Good, I've got a beer there. So <laughs> hey, Gavin! No, no, good as gold. Yeah, yeah, anything, I know it's a bit oh, mad oh, walking in with my camera on me. No, 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 We're bored about all that. We've worked with cameras on us for fucking 24 hours a day. Yeah, I know. Tell him everything. We've been one of my best mates. We've been one of my mates like, yeah, since we was yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. One of the most staunchest, nicest yeah. fellas in the world you're ever going to yeah. meet. I actually met him in Maidstone Prison when he was serving seven years for oh, manslaughter. Okay. Okay. And I say, then, uh, I know Gavin is a serious man because, <coughs> excuse me, Gavin got the sunglasses with the tie. So he ain't going to never lose that. So he don't lose no battles. You feel me? That's what I just gathered. And then we come out and we become good friends and ever since he's been one of my best mates in the world. And he's always been there for me. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's been a father figure, but he always, he's always been an older brother, but best friend. Mm. He always has been. Mm. And he's never wanted nothing off me. No. Always give oh, me. Mm. Mm. True? Yeah, it's good. I love him, mate. Yeah. I love you as well. Yeah. It's like being on be the side of the Sopranos. They all seem to love Vic. <laughs> But then they've never been at the wrong end of him or his gun. Well, he's just one in a million, mate. Yeah. yeah. This is Glenn. He runs his own steel supply business. Funny, really, since <clears throat> been seen out with him, everyone pays me on time. It's quite yeah, it's nice. It's that reputation, man. Right? Phone call and the checks in the post. But, um, reputation. Yeah. No, it's good, really, because when yeah. I first met Vic, the business was probably doing, I don't know, mm. seven, eight million a year turnover. It's up to about 20 million now. And you don't do that sort of turnout without people like his name yeah. behind you yeah so although i ain't got no involvement in the business where we've grown close mm. if it's anyone ever stuff. tries to um like not me he's, he's just <coughs> his name's enough he don't yeah. even have to get on the phone so while they all love him there ain't no doubt about his stature time for me to make me exit <laughs> the pals are always a different thing you know it's always it's always a whole new, a whole. Danny, you was invited to the cookout, man. You should have stayed. Had you some barbecue, some burnt ends, some burgers. Like, what you doing? Why was you so fearful? I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna. Glenn, he was all on you. He shook your hand for about five minutes straight. So I, 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 I get it almost. I get it. Can you? No bowl game, and um, yeah, you know, as soon as I walked in. You know, the first geezer stands up, looks me straight in the eye. I thought, okay, what, what is this a test? It's almost <laughs> not, not mafia like. Yeah. The, you know, they sort of, they just, Ooh. they've got their circle of people, and ah. that's it. So, what had led Vic down the criminal path? I've asked him to take me back to the beginning to see where it all began, to the East End. We're driving through Canning Town, and it stirs memories for Vic. It breeded a really hard type person because it was the dock lands, they yeah. worked in the docks, I mean, and, and they was nicking things out the docks. The good thing about Canning Town, it was, it was known like, it was very staunch people, weren't they, yeah. in, in, in them days. There was like sort of, uh, you know, you, you know, anyone who come from Canning Town, most of the jails was filled up with Canning Town yeah. people, to be honest yeah. with us, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. We was brought up in a thing called the old school. Mm. You helped the granny across the roads, you know what I mean? You made sure the working, you never robbed a working class person in your life, you stuck up for them. Throughout its history, the East End has been one of the poorest areas of London. Those living here worked hard to earn their bread. However, some went further and used crime to get the jam. If you look at crime in the East End of London in particular, you, you can define it in some... Isn't there a show called East Enders? Is this what it's about? As a form of self-help exercise, you know, it's the people, it's the have-nots trying <coughs> to be the haves, finding their own way of getting what they need and what they want. The courage and resilience of the East Enders was well documented during World War II. These people were bombed night after night, but however the Germans tried, they couldn't break their spirit. 
as London was rebuilt after the war. Being an East End gangster was like being a film star. You got the best in life. Oh, it was all the glamour and all the girls. The Crays were at the forefront of the 60s London underworld. They were respected in this part of the world and they were feared everywhere else. The communities that are very close, that look after themselves, that generally come out of poverty, quite often they're using their money to help their own. This is the code that Vic inherited, the basis of the world he operated in. He's brought me to his old neighbourhood in Leytonstone, where he grew up. It was like a shop, and in here used to be an old junk shop, and this used to be my front door. <coughs> the worst thing when you're a kid to live behind a junk shop, you're going to grow up with a fucking chip on your shoulder, aren't you, mate? And you literally, ain't you? My old man go, where do you live? I go, I live behind a junk shop. I go, fuck's sake, you know what I mean? We never had a proper bath for years. You know, like, and if I wanted some shoes, I wanted that, it was all like, everything was double iron. <coughs> yeah. And it was at the school, yards from his home, that Vic met friends that gave him his first taste of crime. While still in their teens, they began by doing jobs on jewellery shops, by making holes in the windows. We used to have a big, you know, the big metal catapults, you know, the big things we used to get the ball bearings. The bigger the ball bearing, the bigger the hole in the window. Yeah. So like, we just stood there like that, as the lorry goes, going, Poof. cool. So as long as it didn't hit the silver strip, the bells wouldn't go. So it's like a bullet, it was like, yeah. whoop. And it's go over like the old coat hangs you get out of the dry cleaners, you know, the, the thin ones and that, get a look on it. You just go over this and they call the fucking shit. What is that? out the windows, all that cool, so a little time, all these jewellery shops were getting, so I had to knock that on here, because obviously they were looking for geese doing all the jewellery windows. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when I was in that house, we used to have these wardrobes, and I used to stack all my money out in the wardrobe, and I used to think, you know, here, here you are, big tough fucking arm robber, right, and go, when I was a kid, go, fucking hope my mum don't find out, she'll kill me. <laughs> 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 That's what it was like. We drive up the road <laughs> to Posh Wanstead. I met this bird, right, this is where she lived. Right? Now you see the difference of the areas. Mm. This is like, this area was like, you know what I mean, Dan? It's nice. five minutes down the road, I don't know, it? Yeah, and she lived up here. And I went into her house and like, I was like, fucking hell, beautiful house, chandeliers and... Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is what really catapulted me into wanting money, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, because you look, see the area to where we just come from. Yeah. I know, mean, oh, it's mad, isn't it? This is my girlfriend, ex-girlfriend's house here. I'd come into these areas and I'd realise what money was about then, do you know what I mean? So this is what really, really kicked me off, you know what I mean? Yeah, you think, I want a taste of it, I yeah, want some I, of it. I want some of it, yeah. yeah. I weren't going to get it fucking working at Falls. So Vic had no choice. It was his poverty that had led him to a life of crime. So his brother must be a criminal as well then. Hello. What is this? It's an ad that keep popping up. I don't know what ad it is, so I can stop it. It's kind of like softcore. Softcore elevator music. But it turns out nothing could be further from the truth. Vic's younger brother. At this point, I'm feeling played. Like now, they now I'm getting played. Like, how do I ex close ad? Close ad. You can't even close the ad. Look, look how many times it's popping up. Close this. Thirty-one four. Thirty-one oh four. Nah, we gotta refresh, bro. It can't keep doing this to me. At this point, it's playing us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm Danny Dyer, playing hard men and acting. I know who you are. Well, we gotta get to the bottom of this. Alright. Looks like it's cool now. Alright, alright, alright. No, 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 no. X out. No, no, no. X. 
Keep in mind, I'm one of the best editors on YouTube, so y'all can What is that? That's so annoying. Are we gonna deal with this the whole- No, hold on, man. Y'all can't just keep doing this to me like this. We got 10 minutes left and they want to keep playing elevator music. Vic's younger brother Tony is a multi-millionaire. <clears throat> he had the same upbringing, but made different choices, making his fortune out of packaging, not robbery. He was chasing money at an early age, I think. And I think that was your route, you know, you, you was working, you was working all weekends, weren't you, on the railways? Grafting nuts off, earning 50, 60 quid a weekend, and every weekend you just you just just doing the same thing. I think <clears> enough <throat> was enough, and you said this is it. I want to I want to earn easy money. I'm glad really that my brother took the route he did, because um, like I say, he's made the family proud. But, and, uh, but we, we, we have made us. As like I said, we all took different routes, and he has made us, <coughs> you know, a brilliant business. Sorry. And, uh, he's put the family on the map, really. What I wanted to know was why Vic hadn't made the same decisions as his younger brother. Why do you think you took a different path to your brother then? Some brothers look... Honestly, Vic walked that path so his brother could run this path. His little brother could run this path. His little brother seen the mistakes he made and he was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Let me do it this way. You can't say all brothers are the same. No. They're totally different. You've got two, two different brothers yeah. and he, he, like you said, he, he's always been good. He's been not one of them natural people who's like, I'll cheat him at cards and still win. It's just one of people, oh, whatever right. I did, whatever he's done, he's turned to gold. Being living behind a junk shop, not even having no money, yeah. it, we both strive to get where we wanted to be. Obviously, he's took the long road and got him done really, and like I said, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the people who work hard and get there. Not normal working class people. Obviously, I took shortcuts. I decided to go out and take what I wanted. And he Shortcuts decided to go never right really worked. Which is, I know I was wrong. Yeah. And I say it to all the kids out there, I knew I was wrong. What I did then, I know I was wrong. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, if I could change my life tomorrow and be like my brother, I would have done it. Yeah. I wasn't born with a silver no. spoon in my mouth. I was born behind a junk shop with my mum and dad, bless them. And as I say, but I, I weren't going to have it. I wanted to go different routes. Mm. My brother's took the time, he's got here, and I love it a bit. It's fantastic. I couldn't believe the difference between the two. Perhaps Vic's bad example had been a warning to his younger brother. It's, that's, a, that's exactly what it was. The new life. Vic's moved out of London now, and he's trying to make a new life for himself. Leave the past in the past. What could be more different from the toughness of the East End than this sleepy suburban village? <laughs> Vic the muck and crime for mowing the grass. And tending the roses. Life for me has changed so dramatically. In this area, it's mostly like it's a sort of middle class, rich area, really. Um, very, I suppose, ooty tooty. There's so much greenery. Very, very what? What did that mean? I suppose, ooty tooty. Ooty tooty. There's so much greenery and. And just wake up in the mornings and it's so nice just to be sort of alive really I look out I've got big trees at the back of my house all swaying around and you know and it's just absolutely lovely just like i would never ever ever move back to london ever that's how i feel about florida again you know he's also met the love of his life allison he's completely different to what you think he's going to be he's kind he's gentle he's a gentleman okay i suppose that's he's Good quality. My boy, Vic. These days, yeah. Anyway. Well, I love her, don't I? So, this is just sort of, um, sometimes I found very hard to love someone after so long in prison. Um, but now, sort of, I've broke all them barriers down, and it's, um, it's nice to find love again, you know, so it's nice. I wondered what she made of his past. To be quite truthful, I know bits and pieces, but I don't know everything. I don't really want to know everything. Some people have said, oh, what he's done and what he hasn't done, and I don't really want to know. I've never even read a book or nothing of his at all, so. It don't matter. You love him for who he is right now, man, and that's, that's what counts. 
Shout out to you. It's about now, isn't it? Not the past. So I like to make my mind up about anyone anyway. For 20 years, 21 years, I was wrapped around men. So it's nice to come out and I'm wrapped around the family again. And it's absolutely so. Last thing on my mind is knocking about with gangs or groups of fellas. So I'm just I'm milking every minute of it because it's something I've dreamed about for the last 21 years. He tends to be a bit cautious around food as well. He doesn't like going to strange places to eat. I suppose that's affected him being in prison all them years. Yeah. In prison, people had spat in Vic's food. He'd paid for his crimes then, and he was still paying now. I could see his past didn't want to let him go. That's what you hear when there's a bug in your car. So now I'm going to run this car, just say you run a car, like this. A few years ago, the police used surveillance technology to entrap Vic. She run it round the bottom, like that. He was acquitted with a conspiracy to murder charge. Today, he doesn't take any chances. I've got to be whiter and white. I've got to be... I didn't even know. I should get one of them. <clears throat> I don't have a car to... <laughs> put in the bug, but hey. Snow White. I'm looked at all the time, so... I've got to be... Everything's got to be right. Car insurance, your tax, everything. Everything's got to be right. Everything's got to be paid. All the bills got to be paid. Everything's got to be done. You've got to be ultra <clears throat> white. Especially in my situation, <clears throat> so... More so than anyone on the planet Earth, really. So this gear here, this gear here, what's it, legal or what? No, it's, you can buy it from any shop, any spy shops. Yeah. It's called anti-surveillance. Right, so listen, we both know you're straight going now. Now, what, why, would they, why would they bug you? Because they want to. Because like, what it is, it's, just, it's people you knock about with. So I could be, you could be at it and I don't know. I could come, I can walk up to you, you might be up to something, I don't know what you're up to, I ain't gonna ask you what you're up to, I'm not a busy body fucker, am I? No. So whatever you're doing could get me in trouble because I don't know what you're doing. Mm. They think my association with you, mm. just because I'm talking to you, means that I'm guilty of a crime I don't even know about. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why you have got to be careful what you say. That's true. Say like you're in, in some do. people's tellies are... That's true, they do get on that. Bugs. Mm. Literally, they watch you through the, the telly. I know it's science fiction, but it's true. Mm. So there you are. You know you've got a bug in the telly, so you, you fancy your leg over. You can't even have sex in, in the front room, can you? in your telly, yeah. watching you. Yeah, literally. A couple of Fact. days is plotted up, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 You're never going to be out of that world, are you, with a place? No, never. Putting paranoid, man. I'm always going to have them on me back. I get it, though. I say, one, what you're up against is one of the biggest firms, tastiest firms. Oh. Well, Funded firms probably in the world, mm. MI6, mm. Soco, the old National Crime Squad. Mm. You're up against some of the biggest, tastiest firms. Do not <gasps> underestimate them at any time. You know, so everything Facts. No, you, do, right. you have to watch. I had to, especially when you was in and out of prison like that, and for the things that you did. Yeah, you get. I get it. I get it. Remind myself why the police might not be interested civilian. in Vic. He'd done some pretty serious crimes in his time. The mad thing about doing this, this, you know, meeting Vic is that it's the first time I've actually sort of, uh, uh, you know, done, done one of these shows about someone who's from my manor, from my area, speaks the same way as me, he's been brought up with the same sort of morals, the difference being, the thing what, you know, look, listen, I, I know his game, he's a bank robber, he's hurt people, and, you know, the fascinating thing for me is that this man's done 21 years in prison. He spent half his life behind bars, and it obviously sort of moulds you into something, you know, being incarcerated. It also seems it haunts your life forever. Coming up, Vic can't leave things alone. <laughs> what he thinks of the kids of today. I just want him to know the fucking misery they're going to cause on both sides of the fence. And I find out what almost pushed him over the edge. I thought about suicide once or twice in my life. Oh, I wouldn't even have took him for that. This would be interesting, what is this work? Vic Dart was one of this country's most feared armed robbers. It held guns to people's heads. But for his crime, he did the time. 21 years in total. While Vic was in prison, he had a lot of time to think. He told me he wants to right a few wrongs. It seems to be a better use of his energy. I met up with him at this snooker hall to chew the fat. He was upset about the number of stabbings in the news, and he wanted people to learn from his prison experience. I'm not a standard being a hero. Mm. 
I'm not going to say to kids, like, follow my footsteps, because I've been a total disaster. I've been banging up for 21. That's the one thing, man. The older generation wants to come and let people learn from their mistakes, but that's not going to... It works to a certain extent, but people are going to make their own mistakes. They're going to go live their life, and they got to learn their own lessons, man. And that's the sad part, man. People don't learn from history. They just repeat it. It's crazy. It is. Absolutely hard, way. There's me. no winners in this game. No winners. And the murder squad's rate is 99.5. They nearly get everyone. So not, most of them will get arrested, all these young kids. So before they do it, I just want them to know the fucking misery they're going to cause on both sides of the fence. The person who dies and the person who goes to prison. Because the person who goes to prison is going to get 20 years of hell. At least the kid who ever happened to, he, he didn't really know about it, but their family will. So there's two losers in that game. There's never one winner. No, in a million years does anyone win. Vic is concerned with the high incidence of suicide in the prison system. <clears throat> in prison, he made friends with a guy called David Croak. Okay. Croak was a convicted murderer and was found hanging in his cell at Whitemore Prison in November 2007. Official investigations into the incident point to suicide, with these black hires being caused by a fall. No. But Vic believes otherwise. He's made it his mission to help Croak's family. With black eyes. We want an inquiry, don't we? We want a, our own people, the solicitors, to interview the prisoners who were there, want the names. We want our own body to investigate what happens to your dad. Yeah. That's what we want. Yeah, there is going to be inconsistencies, as I did already. Off bad. That don't look like no. Sort of things is that most people, when they get out of prison, they forget about the fellow prisoner in back in prison. After being in prison for 21 years of my life, I can't forget. I'm a, a, a straight goer, as they call me, and um, certain questions and certain people you need to speak to. It's, it's, it's nice to have someone like Vic, uh, who, who's there for you by your side, and he's, he's, he's asking the questions, talking to people that you, you wouldn't normally be able to do. And there's a lot of people in the prison systems who are fighting their case who've got no one to shout out to. And I'm just speaking on behalf of all my friends. And there's a lot more, a lot, a lot, a lot more. That's that loyalty, At man. At the brave side of Croak, Vic... I ain't gonna lie, Vic a real one. I like Vic, man. He could be, we could be cool. It's a chance to reflect. We homies. I've lost quite a few friends in prison. <clears throat> About 11 friends have died in prison. And uh, you wake up in the morning and you just think, you're numb, you just don't understand it. It's, it's just a list and list of people. I thought about suicide once or twice in my life in the long prison sentence I've done, but obviously I fought for it. And it is, you do, they, you go to the edge. And like I say, I've pulled myself back, you know, I see my mum looking down and just find a life out of me. I mean, I've seen people rip their chest turns out, I've seen people cut their wrists, I've seen people hanging themselves. I mean, it's just a, it's just, prison, it's not what you think it is, it's a proper horror factory. I just wish I grew up some way different. And, uh, I just wish I, I just wish, well, I can't wish, I can't wish, it's, it's happened, I can't feel sorry for myself. It was plain to see that Vic's time in prison still haunted him today. But was it the prison time that he regretted or the crimes that he'd done? Both. When you look back over the robberies you've done. They go hand in hand, don't they? How do you feel? You know, how do you, how do you feel about that? I mean. I just I just feel a bit guilty for all the people I've caused mayhem to, really. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel I've, you know, I'd like to apologise while I'm on the programme, sort of all the upset I cost, caused a lot of people, but I've done my time. And uh, I'm not proud of it. I'd met a man who'd run around London with a shotgun and a sledgehammer, stacking his winnings in his wardrobe and living it up. But a man who'd lost 21 years shut up in jail, who was still haunted by the shadows of his past and felt people were still out to get him. I'd found a man whose crimes hadn't paid. I dreamed of being a family man over the last 21 years locked up. Yeah. So I got what I want and believe it or not, that's what keeps me on the straight now and my family. I've got too much to lose now. Does he got kids? No, The game's right? over. I've retired. I ain't gonna 
I'm like, yeah, that was a smooth ending, wasn't it? The game's over. I retired. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's go to family, man. We almost got 51,000. Can we get to 75? Like, what's eight? Hey, let's be real. A lot of y'all right here are not following me. 60, no, how many percent? Like 70% of the people that watch my channel don't follow me. It just comes up in their in their thread and they're like, oh, let me just watch. That's, it matters to us. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we want that plaque, man. We want that 100,000 subscribers plaque, man. It's, 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 it's a trophy for me and I want that trophy. Simple as that. <laughs> TLL, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post, man. I'm gone.